Good morning, good, af good afternoon and good evening, according to the time zone. I am Giorgio Marapodi, Director General for Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here today online for the official opening of the 2021 edition of the SDG 16 conference, Transforming Governance for a More Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Future. SDG 16 as the roadmap to respond to COVID-19 and build back better. I should note before we begin that the conference will be recorded and, and live streamed on IDLO's Facebook channel, accessible also via the conference website. Please also note that the simultaneous interpretation for English, French, Spanish and Italian is provided during all sessions of the conference. And now it is with a great pleasure that I pass the floor to her pass the floor to Harina Sereni, Vice Minister for Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy, for her welcoming remarks. Minister Sereni, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ambassador Marapodi. Uh, Mr. Liu, Secretary General, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Mrs. Beagle, Director General of IDLO, uh, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the second SDGs 16 conference on transforming governance for a more, more peaceful, just and inclusive future. SDG 16 as the roadmap to respond to COVID-19 and build back better. Italy as a strong advocate of the SDG 16 is particularly keen to virtually host in Rome this conference organized in collaboration with our partners UNDESA and IADLO. IDLO. Since the early negotiations of the 2030 Agenda, we have been committed to support the need to bridge peace and development through the pillars of justice, good governance, respect for fundamental freedoms, human rights and the rule of law. We have often defined SDG 16 as one of the main enablers of the 2030 Agenda. It is the principle that shapes the social pact between people and institutions, which is essential to create an environment where justice, the rule of law, and the promotion of human rights can thrive. Food insecurity, extreme poverty, lack of biodiversity, inadequate access to health care and quality education are issues that cannot be faced without good governance both at local and global levels. Institutions are fundamental drivers of development, determining success or failure in tackling poverty, reducing inequality and sharing prosperity. Governance and institutions are also vital to building the peaceful, just and inclusive societies promised by SDG 16. Failures and abuses by justice institutions are potent drivers of exclusion and insecurity. Dysfunctional and discriminatory institutions can fuel the grievance, grievances that lead to violence and conflict. Insecurity makes it harder for societies to build the institutions they need in order to develop sustainability. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the need for good governance even more urgent, acting as a stress test for institutions. It has created extraordinary new demands on governments and has increased risk of corruption that could challenge their legitimacy in the long term. It has also dramatically emphasized the importance of the goal 16 for successful national responses, promoting an equitable, just and sustainable recovery to build resilience to future shocks and crises. 
An equitable, just, and sustainable recovery means that we need to support the most vulnerable members of our societies and provide equal opportunities for all. The fight against all forms of discrimination based on race, social origins, religion, political belief, disability, age, sexual orientation, and gender identity is a top priority that transparent and credible institutions should guarantee through the effectiveness of the rule of law. A just recovery implies renewing our commitment to tackle gender inequality. Too many women and girls are still left behind with no chance to enjoy equal rights. Too many are deprived of resources and opportunity. Too many have their voices silenced and too many are denied their fundamental right to access of access to justice. Building resilience to future shocks and crises can only start by renewing the social contract to rebuild trust between people and state. To this end, we need to ensure equity in the delivery of services to strengthen public participation, transparency and accountability to support the independence of judicial institutions and to reinforce action to fight corruption. Despite these enormous challenges, the crisis must also be considered an opportunity to reimagine the role of institutions and policy making, promote new governance norms and shift to transformative pathways and strengthen resilience and accelerate action to achieve the SDGs. That is why I am pleased to note that so many distinguished policymakers, heads of multilateral organizations, representatives of civil society and academia are participating in this conference in order to undertake a multi-stakeholder assessment of the impact of the pandemic on progress towards SDG 16. The conference will at the same time address the transformative contribution that SDG 16 can make in helping to safeguard and accelerate progress on the 2030 agenda. Your collective work will be the key stepping stone towards the 2020 high level political forum in New York next July. Your thoughts and recommendations will be crucial to rethink governance with SDG 16 at its center especially in the difficult circumstances left by the COVID-19 pandemic. We will need to turn challenges into, you, into you opportunities in order to build that better. Uh, governance is central to this process, both in our collective response to COVID-19 and in working towards the realization of the 2030 Agenda. Collective actions for improved governance offer the most sustainable approach to recovery and leave no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be our task for the next three days. I wish you all productive and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice, Thank you, Vice Minister. Uh, the conference has been honored to receive messages from uh, His Excellency Mr. Volkan Volskir, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Ambassador Munir Akram, President of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, and Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary, Secretary General of the United Nations. We will first hear from uh, his Excellency, Mr. Volkan Bolskir. Go until 2030, what was supposed to be the decade of action on delivery to implement the sustainable development goals has instead become a decade of recovery. The global COVID-19 pandemic has upended all our best laid plans and made the accelerated push for progress only that much more urgent. This includes SDG 16, where the prioritization of public health and well-being necessitated the implementation of emergency measures, including the closure of civic spaces, 
limitations on public gathering, and reduced access to institutions and services. While understandable during the darkest day of the pandemic, these actions have had significant impacts on civic life and should be gradually scaled back as we continue the slow but steady emergence from COVID-19. Colleagues, as has been said time and again, we must use the space opened by the pandemic to not only build back, but to recover better, to employ the SDGs as a roadmap to a more sustainable, resilient recovery. SDG 16 can serve as a linchpin in this process. Responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels will boost public support and add credibility, transparency, and accountability to recovery efforts, particularly as it relates to the use of public resources. As we roll out, what will surely be the largest, most expensive recovery or our world has ever undertaken, we cannot risk losing popular support or undermining our own efforts. Every misplaced dollar hinders our response and recovery efforts and further limits efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda. In real terms, it denies our healthcare workers the tools and support mechanisms to fight this pandemic. This point was underscored in February when the report of the high-level panel on international financial accountability, transparency and integrity for achieving the 2030 Agenda outlined 14 recommendations to address the challenges faced by governments and institutions in this regard. Amongst the many points outlined was the need to tackle corruption, for which we have a zero-tolerance approach. Looking ahead, the General Assembly will host a special session to deal with the issue of corruption 2 to 4 June. The special session will provide an opportunity to shape the global anti-corruption agenda for the next decade by advancing effective and innovative approaches and by sharing best practices and developing new standards and mechanisms. Dear colleagues, the REIT reset is an opportunity for us to achieve a better world in the post-COVID era. For us to achieve this, we must be willing to anchor peace, justice, and inclusion in COVID-19 response and recovery plans. Let us move forward together in full openness, with full respect for the pillars of strong institutions, peaceful and just societies, and good governance. On this note, we were pleased to host the high-level dialogue on urban safety security and good governance, making crime prevention a priority for Ellen April 22nd. This event allowed member states and partners to reflect on the challenges in strengthening governments and institutional arrangements to address urban safety, particularly in the post-COVID era. Before closing, allow me to emphasize that a key target of SDG 16 is the prevention of violence against women and girls, of which strong institutions are key. Over the past year, we have witnessed a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence emerge as public health containment measures have had the inadvertent effect of fall off most at risk and reducing their access to support services. This unprecedented challenge undermines progress on target 1631 regarding reporting to competent authorities or other officially recognized conflict resolution mechanisms. We must do better. As you proceed through your discussions today, I ask that you place special emphasis on women and girls and help ensure that our governance system, our institutions, and our societies are well equipped to support those in need. Thank you. 
And now our, our, our next message is from the president of ECOSOC, His Excellency, Mr. Munir Akram. And the Secretary General Liu, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference on transforming governance for a more peaceful, just, and inclusive future. SDG 16 as the roadmap to respond to COVID-19 and build back better. It is significant that the SDGs incorporated peace, justice, and an inclusive future as integral to the realization of the rest of the SDGs. Peace and development are interdependent. The concept of peace is enshrined and elaborated in the UN Charter and international law, including international humanitarian law. Peace is challenged firstly by interstate conflicts and disputes. The preservation of international peace and security is the primary responsibility of the Security Council, the General Assembly <clears throat> and related mechanisms. The United Nations continues to play a vital role in preserving and promoting international peace and security, including through conflict resolution, mediation, and UN peacekeeping. Adherence to the principles of the UN Charter, the non-use of force, respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, non-interference in their internal affairs, and the exercise of the right of self-determination by peoples. Peace is also often disrupted within states for a variety of reasons. The underlying causes include poverty and underdevelopment, conflicts over scarce resources, environmental degradation, and weak governance. In many instances, such internal challenges are exacerbated by external factors. In such situations, the concerned countries can be assisted to restore peace and stability through international support and development cooperation. The work of the Peace Building Commission and the Peace Building Fund have a vital role in helping countries which are emerging from conflict. Such support is especially essential in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exacerbated poverty and inequality among and within countries. The recently concluded Financing for Development Forum outcome document has identified a set of important measures to extend financial and other support to the developing countries. The work being done by the IDLO to assist the least developed countries to attract investment in sustainable development projects is one example of such support. The goal of promoting justice under SDG 16 also encompasses the international and national dimensions. Justice flows from equality, injustice from inequality, discrimination, and lack of fairness in policy and practice. As the Secretary General has stated, inequality is the hallmark of our times. In promoting the goal of justice, it is vital to address inequality at both the international and national levels. To this end, at the international level, we must work towards an inclusive and equitable global financial architecture, a fair and inclusive international tax regime, an equitable development-oriented trade regime, and an end to illicit financial flows from developing countries and the reform and the return of their stolen assets. At the national level, the United Nations can extend assistance to countries to promote justice, adherence to the rule of law, and good governance. This can be extended in particular to countries emerging from conflict and where judicial institutions have collapsed. 
However, elsewhere, such assistance should be extended at the request of the governments of the concerned countries. Moreover, it is not self-evident that such assistance and advice is required only by developing countries. There are numerous situations in certain advanced countries where inequality and discrimination, especially against minorities and immigrants, requires redress and a greater adherence to the principles of international law and human rights. SDG 16 rightly also speaks of inclusion. This implies a future global economic and social order where no country, people or individual are excluded from the benefits of development and progress. A new and equal national and international order. We must work collectively to promote the vision of such an equal and inclusive world where no one is left behind. I thank you. And it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Liu Zenmin. UN, UN and the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs will deliver the message of the UN Secretary General and then speak on behalf of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, one of the co-organizers of this conference, along with the International Development Law Organization and Italy. Mr. Liu Zemin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Marapodi, for moderating this uh, event. Your Excellency, Ms. Mar Marina Serini, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and the International Cooperation of Italy. Your Honorable Jan Bigo, Director General of the International Development Law Organization, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start by thanking the President of the General Assembly and the President of ACASOC in delivering their uh, opening remarks to this meeting. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I'm honored to convey the following message of the Secretary General Antonio Guterres to, the, to this conference. The message reads as follows. The COVID-19 pandemic is the greatest global test since the funding of the United Nations. It has caused tremendous human suffering, upended eco economies, and reversed progress towards sustainable development goals. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its promise to leave no one behind must guide pandemic recovery. The challenges we face are immense, from providing equitable access to vaccines, to securing peace, to addressing debt issues, to combating climate change, to tackling entrenched and growing inequalities. Conflict, insecurity, weak institutions, and limited access to justice remain great threats to building a better world. As the Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly SDG 16, make clear, sustainable development depends on peace, stability, respect for human rights, and effective governance based on the rule of law. Success will require a transformation of governance. At the national level, I'm calling for a new social contract to renew the basis for trust between governments and their citizens. The post-pandemic period must be rooted in justice for all, accountability and participation. A new social contract is about building inclusive and sustainable societies, investing in social co cohesion and ending all forms of exclusion, discrimination and racism. Establishing a new generation of social protection, providing access to education for all and harnessing digital technology and guaranteeing equal rights and opportunities for women and girls as we ensure the centrality of human rights in all we do in line with my core to action on human rights. At the international level, 
a new global deal should renew the spirit of the United Nations Charter and revive trust among nations. A new global deal must be funded on a fair globalization based on rights and dignity of every human being and living in balance with nature and on our responsibilities to future generations. It should bridge huge gaps in governance structure and ethical frameworks and ensure that global policies, global political and economic systems deliver on critical global public goods. Together, let us pledge to build solutions that are fair, build resilience, and leave no one behind. That concludes the message of the Secretary General. So dear colleagues, let me deliver my opening remarks. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome you to the 2021 SDG 16 conference on transforming governance for a more peaceful, just and inclusive future. SDG 16 as a roadmap to respond to COVID-19 and build back better. I wish to thank the government of Italy for making this conference happen. I also thank the International Development Law Organization for partnering with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, to organize this event. I'm pleased to see that many leaders from governments, international organizations, civil society, and academia have joined us. At the heart of this conference is the relationship between COVID-19 and Sustainable Development Goal 16. Understanding this multifaceted relationship is critical to an inclusive and a sustainable recovery from the pandemic. Unfortunately, however, progress across the various dimensions of SDG 16 has been uneven. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated many of the worrying trends. For example, the pandemic has created major disruptions to the functioning of governments as a whole. Restrictions and the social distancing measures have challenged the working methods and the processes of par parliaments and the courts, creating obstacles for the regular conduct of businesses. This can further undermine legislative oversight and the lawmaking, limiting judicial enforcement and affecting citizens' access to justice. The disruptions have further challenged institutional arrangements that enable government departments levels to work together to foster policy institutional policy integration and to engage with non-state actors. At the same time, the pandemic has elevated the risks as the government implements response to the crisis for accountability and to integrity, including through great opportunities for fraud and corruption. These risks further impact the delivery of the SDGs. Distinguished participants, these challenges make effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions more important than ever. At the same time, they reveal the potential for improvement in cross-cutting dimensions of government action, such as crisis preparedness, science and policy interface, communication, and use of digital government, which are important determinants of government okay. capacity to manage crisis. Right. To this end, HG16 is vital and can help to accelerate the progress on the 2030 agenda. Moreover, key principles such as effectiveness, transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness can strengthen the capacity of societies to withstand shocks and recover better. This will be critical as we recover yeah. from the crisis. Without a doubt, however, major challenges lie ahead, which this conference will explore. As we move forward in these efforts, I would like to highlight 
two critical functions. First, the role of public institutions and public servants. The responses to the pandemic have shown that it is necessary and possible for public institutions and public administrations to play a proactive role. In spite of the extreme challenges, public institutions and public servants have responded to the crisis. They have adapted by adapting and redeploying human resources, devising new ways to keep delivering public services and, and adapting administrative processes to allow for speed and flexibility. Second, the role of digital government. A defining feature of the pandemic period has been, been the reliance on digital technologies and the use of digital government tools. Digital procedures were adopted by public institutions, such as parliaments, to continue to function during the pandemic. Governments, often in collaboration with the non-state actors, have deployed an impressive range of digital solutions in response to the pandemic. These have included contact tracing, social distancing, and, and virtual and tracking, information sharing, health education, and e-business, and working and learning from home. Indeed, the pandemic spurred many governments to accelerate digitalization of administrative processes and public services. However, the widening digital divide and the threats to privacy, security, and ethical use of information and misinformation remains a reality uh, which we must address in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, less than nine years remain before the end of date for the sustainable development goals in 2030. Making progress as it is seeking is not only needed, to achieve SDGs. It is a requirement for sustainable and inclusive recovery from the pandemic. This conference represents a unique opportunity to make progress in this direction. I look forward to the discussions and to your conclusions. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Liu. Um, uh, I'm now pleased to give the floor to Mrs. Jan Beagle, Director General of International Development Law Organization, the other co-organizer of this conference. Mrs. Beagle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Maripodi. Vice Minister Sereni, Under Secretary General Liu, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. On behalf of IDLO, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the second global SDG 16 conference. I would like to thank the government of Italy and DESA for their continued partnership at a critical moment for SDG 16 and for the entire 2030 agenda. At first glance, the targets of goal 16, ranging from reducing violence, ensuring legal identity, eliminating corruption and improving access to information have little in common. What unites them into one cohesive whole is the concept of good governance based on the rule of law and human rights. The principles of equality and non-discrimination, the focus on effective institutions and participatory decision-making, and the commitment to leaving no one behind, which are at the core of Goal 16, are also interwoven across the other SDGs. It is these common threads which come together to form a vision of development that is inclusive, just, and sustainable that make the 2030 Agenda truly transformative. As we take stock of progress on SDG 16 and explore ways to accelerate it in the face of the pandemic, allow me to share three observations drawing on IDLO's experience. First, COVID-19 is putting governance at all levels to the test. To successfully meet this challenge, our response must be based on the rule of law. We face not just a public health emergency, but a political, social, and economic crisis of historic proportions. Some have resorted to broad authoritarian measures, 
using the pandemic as a pretext. Laws and institutions are being used to limit people's rights, narrow the space for debate, and avoid scrutiny of public decisions. Such actions will ultimately only increase fragility and delay a sustainable recovery. The sheer magnitude of the crisis requires choices and trade-offs that traditional instruments of governance are ill-equipped to make. Unprecedented resources have been mobilized to provide relief and social protection. However, as the uneven and inequitable rollout of vaccines shows, structural inequalities and insufficient consultation and transparency have often undermined the effectiveness of such initiatives. This has further eroded already low levels of public trust. The world is experiencing a crisis of confidence in public institutions at a time we need them the most. Effectively managing the COVID-19 response, protecting human rights, and implementing the 2030 Agenda are ultimately one and the same challenge. And the rule of law is critical to this effort. It can protect the least powerful and give them a voice in the debate, helping build trust. It can enable governments to act quickly and decisively through effective laws and institutions. It can help decision makers to balance competing interests fairly and transparently. And it can help ensure that relief efforts benefit intended recipients by preventing corruption. Over the past year, IDLO has been working with partners in over 30 countries to promote such a rule of law based response to the pandemic. Many of them are here at this conference and we look forward to learning from their experiences. My second point is that we need to prioritize those who are most at risk of being left behind. COVID-19 is exacting an enormous cost in human suffering, in lives, and in wasted potential. Its brunt has been borne by the poorest and most vulnerable. The impact on women and girls has been particularly devastating, threatening to roll back decades of hard-won gains on gender equality. Tackling the multiple and intersecting layers of discrimination faced by women and girls and others living in conditions of exclusion requires effective laws and policies. It requires empowering those living at the margins of society with the knowledge and tools they need to claim their rights. In other words, it requires the rule of law. My third and final point is that the crisis also represents a unique opportunity for achieving the vision of the 2030 Agenda. The pandemic found a world teetering on the brink of change. By disrupting life as we know it, by accelerating the adoption of digital innovation, and by shining a merciless light on our shared fragility, COVID-19 has decisively shattered the status quo. We now face fundamental choices as individuals, as societies, and collectively as one human family about the kind of future we want to build. We can choose the path of narrow self-interest, or we can choose to work together in a renewed spirit of solidarity and multilateralism. The 2030 Agenda represents both humanity's highest aspirations and our best hope for success. And SDG 16 remains the essential enabler of transformative change. Effective laws and institutions can promote inclusive economic recovery, strengthen preparedness for future crises, and help us transition to a greener and more climate resilient development model. This conference is an opportunity to build greater momentum and increase political and financial support for SDG 16 and a rule of law based recovery from the pandemic. It is also an opportunity to learn from each other I'm delighted to have with us such a distinguished and diverse set of speakers working on the front lines of pandemic response and recovery efforts. After living through over a year of, of a crisis that has challenged us to adapt and innovate, no one has all the answers, but all of us, I'm sure, have part of the answer. Working together, I'm confident that we can overcome the challenges of the present moment and deliver a roadmap for a rule of law based recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Beagle, for 
for this uh, very inspiring speech for, for everybody. Thank you. I also wish to thank on behalf of the host country, all the speakers who have provided remarks during this uh, opening session and to all the participants which uh, have been following us online. I can now declare the opening session closed and the conference officially opened. And I, I would hand the floor back to Mrs. Beagle, who will be the moderator of the two plenaries of today. And I would also invite the speakers of the first plenary session to turn their cameras on. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Ambassador Maripodi. And good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening. And welcome to the first plenary discussion of the Global Conference on SDG 16. Uh, if you are just joining, uh, I'm Jan Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization, and I will be the moderator for day one of the conference, which focuses on our shared fragility. This session looks at how progress towards peaceful, just, and inclusive societies has been impacted by COVID-19 and the implications for the 2030 Agenda. As we have heard, SDG 16 is widely acknowledged as both an outcome and enabler of sustainable development. It must be at the heart of our efforts to manage the crisis and to promote a more just and inclusive recovery. But despite its importance, there has been a sharp deterioration across several aspects of SDG 16 since the 2030 Agenda was adopted. This includes an increase in violence and armed conflict, large-scale humanitarian emergencies, rising authoritarianism, inequalities, intolerance, and social tensions. There is also growing pressure on international norms and standards and attacks on human rights and the independence of the judiciary. Spending on key areas of SDG 16, such as the rule of law, has also declined in ODA and national budgets. COVID-19 threatens to aggravate these trends dramatically, fueling instability and conflict, reinforcing inequalities, undermining trust in governance, and widening the justice gap. Collectively, this represents a profound challenge to humanity's shared aspirations for a better future expressed in the SDGs. To chart a roadmap for a rule of law-based recovery, we need a better understanding of the current situation. And while there has been excellent work done to track COVID-19's impact across different dimensions of SDG 16, this conference is one of the first opportunities for a more holistic, multi-stakeholder assessment. To help guide us through these issues, I am pleased to welcome a lineup of distinguished speakers. They bring a wealth of experience and expertise on SDG 16, its links to peace, development, and human rights, and its importance in the present context. Let me introduce them. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization. Mr. Yamauchi Yoshimitsu, Assistant Vice Minister of Justice of Japan. Under Secretary General, Fekita Moala Katoa Otukamanu, High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. Ms. Fugita Tesla, Deputy Director General for International Cooperation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Mr. Olivia Deschuta, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And Professor Harold Hongju Ko, Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. I will now turn to our distinguished panel. Our first speaker needs no introduction. As Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros has been in the eye of the storm for over a year, coordinating the global response to the pandemic. During these extraordinary challenging times, he has demonstrated the same spirit of multilateralism that he has championed throughout his distinguished career. Dr. Tedros, you're at the center of the most destructive crisis the world has experienced since the Second World War. How have governance capacities at local, national, and international levels, particularly in the public health sector, helped or hindered the global pandemic response? And what lessons can we learn from this experience to prepare for the next crisis? You have the floor.
Thank you, thank you so much, uh, my sister Jan. Um, and thank you to you and also uh, to uh, colleagues at the International Development Law Organization uh, for hosting this important event along with Under Secretary General uh, Liu and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the government of Italy. Uh, even uh, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the world was lagging behind in pursuit of the sustainable development goals. The pandemic has put us even further off track for all uh, the goals, including SDG 16. The pandemic is so much more than a health crisis. It has torn at the very fabric of multilateralism and exposed geopolitical fault lines, inequalities, and the deficit of trust in public institutions. It has demonstrated that good governance can be the difference between life and death. WHO has played a leading role in the response to the pandemic since its beginning as chair of the UN crisis management team. And we have brought together scientists and public health experts from around the world to analyze the evolving evidence and distill it into guidance. And we have brought together partners to form the ACT Accelerator and COVAX. And we have brought together world leaders to foster the political solidarity that's badly needed. The pandemic is still a long way uh, from over. Uh, globally, the number of weekly cases is at a record high. Three million people have died and deaths are increasing. The inequitable distribution of vaccines is adding fuel to the fire and costing lives. Even as we continue to respond to the pandemic, we must also learn the lessons it's teaching us. As countries recover and rebuild, strong public health capacities and resilient health systems will be essential, not only for health security, but for all of the other health threats countries face. Countries need to ensure that their health systems can flexibly and inclusively adapt and surge to meet the increased demands of a health emergency, uh, while minimizing disruption to essential health services. For countries to achieve greater resilience, a coordinated and sustained whole of society approach is needed that ensures the inclusive participation and contribution of all sectors and segments of society. In fragile conflict and vulnerable settings, WHO is working hand in hand with key partners, including UN DESA and UN OCHA. We're also working with mechanisms such as the Global Action Plan for Healthy Lives and Wellbeing for All, the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Early Warning, Early Action and Readiness, and the Joint Steering Committee to Advance Humanitarian and Development Collaboration. The goal of these partnerships is not uh, only improve, uh, to improve collaboration, coherence and coordination among humanitarian development and peace partners, it's also to address the underlying vulnerabilities that continue to fuel crises. Many of these underlying issues are now being exacerbated by the pandemic. Addressing the humanitarian health, development, and peace challenges is in fragile settings, such as the Sahel, is a top priority for WHO. We must improve mechanisms for joint planning, sustainable financing, and strengthening donor coordination to increase resilience and to reduce the reliance on humanitarian assistance. And even as we fight to bring the pandemic to an end, WHO is continuing to support all countries to address gaps in their national capacities for prevention, detection, and response to public health threats. We must learn the lessons of this pandemic and break the cycle of panic and neglect we have seen after so many other emergencies such as outbreaks of SARS, H5N1, H1N1, and Ebola. Many other, many countries are now coalescing behind the idea of an international framework convention on pandemic preparedness and response to enhance international cooperation and solidarity and to strengthen to the implementation of the international health regulations. 
As the UN Specialized Agency for Health, the Framework Convention could be rooted in the Constitution of WHO with its unique global convening power and, and mandate. So let me leave you with uh, three priorities. First, we call on all governments to maintain a comprehensive approach with a tailored and consistent application of public health and social measures, including equitable distribution of vaccines as described in WHO strategic preparedness and response plan. Second, we call on all countries and multilateral agencies to engage with the process of developing the framework convention on pandemic preparedness and response, the pandemic treaty. And third, we call on all countries to increase their investment in resilient health systems built on strong primary health care as the best defense against health emergencies and in peaceful, productive and sustainable societies. Thank you so much and uh, back to you, Jan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros, and thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule uh, to share those insights with us today. We very, very much appreciate it, and I think you have said it uh, more clearly than anyone could. Good governance can be the difference between life uh, and death. We will now uh, move to our next speaker, and I'm very pleased to welcome the Mr. Yamauchi Yoshimitsu, uh, the Assistant Vice Minister of Justice uh, of Japan. Uh, who is attending the SDG 16 conference for the second time. Minister Yamauchi, at the 2019 Rome conference, you invited us to the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice hosted by your ministry. And please accept our congratulations on organizing a very successful meeting in March during this challenging time. Are there insights you can share from the Congress's deliberations on the impact of COVID-19 on progress towards SDG 16 and what this means for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Floor is yours, sir. Oh, oh, thank you for inviting me to the first round and I'm very happy to participate in this second round of conference on the SDG 16. Um, as you have introduced me, I am uh, Yamauchi. I'm the Assistant Vice Minister of Justice in Japan. Uh, and it's a great honor for me to speak in this panel with so much distinguished speakers on the list. And thank you once again for mentioning the Kyoto Congress. Uh, as you see in the background of me, that's where the conference was held. Uh, Kyoto Congress is the short word for the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, and which was held in Kyoto. Uh, it was originally scheduled to be taking place in April 2020, uh, but was postponed for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you may wonder what's the relationship of a crime Congress to SDG 16. Well, this conference main theme was, and I quote, advancing crime prevention and cr criminal justice and the rule of law towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And it brought together government officials, uh, criminal justice practitioners, and other experts uh, to discuss common challenges on crime prevention and criminal justice, including emerging challenges under the COVID-19 pandemics. So under this uh, pandemic, it was organized in a hybrid format, just like today, I think. Uh, in in-person participation and the online participation combined. And surprisingly, it drew 5,600 participants from around the world, both online on, and in-person, despite of this pandemic. And uh, I think your original question was about the deliberation at the Kyoto Congress about the impact of COVID-19 on the progress towards uh, SDG 16. Uh, naturally, in this uh, Congress held under the pandemic, many touch upon that issue. Uh, first, I'd like to recall that the Executive Director Wally of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, the Secretary of the Congress, actually mentioned that this COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the global situation on poverty, and therefore the society is becoming more vulnerable against corruption, terrorism, and other forms of crime. Uh, in everybody kind of echoed on this uh, ob observation and, and, and 
In addition, many participant countries in their deliberation pointed out that, like for instance, you know, prisons uh, are becoming vulnerable uh, for the pandemic. And there's like, the criminals are exploiting uh, high tech during the pandemic, like online criminal activities such as fraud by the criminal organizations are rising. And there's a misuse of uh, online-based tools, especially utilized by like terrorists or violent extremists for their recruitment. And naturally, domestic violence cases is expanding. There's you know there's issues of child online uh, exploitation. So overall, you know social social injustice, should I say, is emerging. Uh, Going back to the SDG 16, this pandemic-related situation is an is you know apparently an obstacle for achieving SDG 16. For example, if you look at SDG 16.1, the, uh, the, the eradication of the violence, 16.2, uh, doing away with child abuse, 16.4 touches upon organized crime, and 16.8 uh, terrorism. So you know we need to cope with these issues. Uh, in the criminal justice sector if we were to achieve SDGs. So in this respect, I would like to draw your attention to the outcome document of the Kyoto Congress, which is Kyoto Declaration. Uh, I hope there are some hints uh, involved, included in the direction where we should be heading. You know, but Kyoto Declaration covers many aspects of crime prevention and criminal justice over like 13 pages and 97 paragraphs. So I wouldn't bore you with all the details, but let me just first point out that since this crime, uh, this declaration is the first of its kind after the adoption of the 2030 agenda. So I'd like to point out that the Kyoto Declaration clearly articulate that there's a strong link between crime prevention, criminal justice, and the rule of law, and the sustainable development. And actually, Kyoto Declaration calls upon member states that the challenge posed and aggravated by the COVID-19 to, to the crime prevention and criminal justice, we need to strengthen the resilience of the law enforcement people and the other crime uh, and other criminal institutions as well. And including, as some, I think uh, Ms. Beagle pointed out, multi-stakeholder partnership. And Kyoto Declaration also, also mentioned, and, and I quote, that we recognize in the light of the ongoing experience of the COVID-19 pandemic and in preparation for any similar future challenges, the need to review criminal justice system and make them more effective, accountable, transparent, inclusive, and responsive through promoting digitalization. He also touches upon, we need to build partnership with the digital industry, the public private sector, and we need to enhance capacity in the IT for law enforcement people. Now, the Congress, Kyoto Congress is, is over. So it's, or we are already on the next stage. And the next stage is to translate a commitment in the Kyoto Con in Declaration that everybody uh, supported into concrete action. And Japan hopes as a host country to do just that because safety and security are preconditions to achieve a peace, justice, and inclusive society that the SDG 16 aims at. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we all look forward to working with you to implement the Kyoto Declaration. Uh, I'm now pleased to welcome Under Secretary General Utukamanu. Uh, Fikita, you are the high representative for least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states. And a recent report by the Committee for Development Policy found that while LDCs have up to now been relatively successful in limiting the direct health impact of COVID-19, the socio-economic fallout has been severe. How can increased legal and institutional capacities help LDCs to accelerate progress towards realizing SDG 16 
and the 2030 Agenda. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I, I thank uh, you and Dessa IDLO and the government of Italy for inviting me to share a few thoughts with you as uh, they pertain to the special situation of least developed countries and, and small island uh, states. Had you asked me 15 months ago to share my thoughts, I would have said we have challenges and we must accelerate work, but the glass is half full. Now, just as you and so many others, uh, I'm deeply concerned that yet another COVID wave with new highly infectious variants washes over too many countries. And the notion of vulnerability has taken on new meaning and has come and will continue to have far reaching social, economic, financial and, and governance impacts on all of us. Many people have said it and the history of pandemics have taught us that we live and will live through deep systemic shocks and changes where we do not even yet know what the true impact of the interlinked health, social, economic, financial and climate crises will be. The LDCs, LLDCs and SIFs will be severely and disproportionately affected. The number of direct health related casualties is not amongst the highest in the world yet the indirect financial and economic consequences of a disrupted planet hit their people hard. Trade, tourism, and foreign direct investment flows have plummeted. Supply chains have been disrupted and foreign direct investment declined. And at a time of rapidly rising resource needs, earnings from exports and government revenues generally dwindle. At the core of the United Nations system support uh, for the LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS was the recognition of the structural vulnerabilities of these countries. The pandemic has exacerbated these structural vulnerabilities and it has ultimately increased poverty. The challenges already prior to the pandemic included inadequate infrastructure in transport, ICT, energy access, and due to geographic features, remoteness from global markets. The movement restrictions the pandemic has brought about and now also the very high cost uh, we see everywhere has to be a direct impact on the LLDCs, LDCs and its trade performances. Prior to the pandemic's onset, many countries had made progress in areas such as good governance, rule of law, protection, and, and promotion of human rights and democratic participation. But we also could see continued, if not escalating conflict in many of the African LDCs and LLDCs we saw election-related violent protests and terrorism on the rise. We saw the inevitably destabilizing mix and vicious spiral of uh, civil unrest, political instability, gender inequality, high un unemployment, particularly amongst the youth, radicalization and forced migration. We all know how such mix leads to worsening spirals of social economic disruptions and development setbacks, not only in conflict affected areas, but in entire regions and beyond. And of course, the origins of instability across LDCs are wide ranging and country and region specific. The common factors are to be found in unequal access to vital and everyday services such as water and sanitation, education, healthcare and housing, corruption and, and challenges of ensuring inclusive participation by all in policy making uh, decisions. In short, it is about the basic driver of all human beings hoping for a better life for themselves and above all their children. People want to be included and not to be excluded. And the perceived hopelessness that poverty uh, will be addressed and deep inequalities will be overcome strongly contribute to eroding trust and social contract between citizens and their governments. Trust is not a given, trust has to be earned through action. And the COVID-19 pandemic has placed new and additional pressures on government's capacity to deliver basic services to the citizens. And we have all seen the pictures of dire medical situation, food and water are a stark warning. But this is not all. As I've said last year, COVID-19 has not given a holiday to the impacts on, on climate change and the impacts on the ongoing climate crisis represents a further and very serious threat to the development prospects of LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS. Climate change is now well accepted as a key factor in maintaining peace and stability. In so many LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS, environmental security 
is ultimately about human security. Like an initially slow moving uh, film and now a very accelerated movie, we can see the impact of climate change on living and livable space and how this increases competition over scarce resources. And take um, February 2018, where Category 5 cyclone Tika struck my own native country, Tonga. The damages were equivalent to 38% of GDP and wiped in a few hours. Then again in April 2020, Cyclone Herod Category 5 struck Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Fiji, and Tonga, leaving widespread destruction. Across the Sahel in West Africa, we see how changes in available grazing land have contributed growing violence and conflict between uh, pastoralists and farmers. It is a struggle for ever more scarce resources that drives displacement and migration. Internal displacement have reached all time highs. The Secretary General uh, Anto Antonio Guterres remarked the following to the Security Council on climate-related security risk discovery, and I quote, where climate change uh, dries up rivers, reduces harvest, destroys critical infrastructure and displaces communities, it exacerbates the risk of instability and conflict, end of quote. We all know that this is particularly devastating for women and girls, minorities, and they do bear the greatest burden of the climate emergency. In so many ways, the LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS are at the forefront of experiencing these interlinked multiple crises. They are and will be our true test of our ability to leave no one behind. SDG 16 argues for just, peaceful, and inclusive societies. SDG 16 touches on the interlinked issues of conflict, insecurity, weak institutions, and limited access to justice as a great threat to sustainable development. Already prior to the pandemic, we know that we had serious legs on the road to achieving the goals of Agenda 2030. We have less than a decade left, and it is now that action and international cooperation must step up to the, to the plate. From OHR perspective, I wish to draw your attention to the Samoa Pathway in the Istanbul Program of Action. They are action uh, programs which recognizes the centrality of peace and security for sustainable development and call for continued efforts to promote peaceful societies and safe communities. More than ever, we now need aim um, at strengthening government institutions uh, capable of transparency, inviting participation, promoting the rule of law, ensuring access to justice, and capable of guaranteeing equality and non discrimination. This, of course, a most go along sustainable and inclusive economic development. And people do not live on work, as someone, uh, as someone uh, famously said, it's the economy. Now is the time for development partners to focus on action, on cooperation at all levels to address the twin requirements of strengthened governance and sustainable inclusive economic development. And this will take partnering, innovation and mobilization of financial resources. And this is especially important when we look at the democratic, uh, democratic uh, trends in many countries. We cannot have countries very youthful populations left and unrepresented. The youth uh, must have uh, a more of a voice in the peace and security agendas. Governments must create creative and inclusive uh, spaces and platforms for young leaders to make this perspectives and needs heard and share knowledge. And uh, in this context, allow me to also mention the investment support program for LDCs developed by IDLO together with OHR LNS. The program goal is to offer legal support by private law firms at no cost to LDCs to support legal and institutional capacities in LDCs. The program is a small step, but a step in the right direction to address the challenges LDCs, LDCs and SIDS are confronted with. The program gives evidence of how public-private partnerships can work together and contribute to an accelerated recovery and increased institutional resilience for the LDCs. In this remaining decade of action, putting to test if we can achieve the goals of Agenda 2030, the LDCs, LLDCs, and SEEDs urgently need special attention. Of course, it is local action that makes all the difference, but at the same time, we must look at the effectiveness of our global governance and arrangement. We have a set of institutions and financing arrangements for action, and they have withstood the test of time. 
but we must ensure that these continue um, to be up to the challenge, that they are truly responsive and capable of addressing the challenges at hand. OHR and NLS together with relevant partners will continue its key advocacy role for the LDCs, MLDCs, and and SID. A key milestone uh, of our question is, is ahead. Uh, just a, a few words on next year's fifth UN conference on LDCs, which will take place in January 2022 in Doha, Qatar. The conference offers an important opportunity to advocate for and increase awareness of the need for peaceful, just, and inclusive society in LDCs. It offers a great opportunity to focus international attention on stepping up support to the LDCs and attract the resources needed and ensure that the LDCs are at the core of any effort and are not left behind. The new 10-year program of action for LDCs, which will be adopted by member states in Doha, comes at a critical time. No effort must be spared to leverage the conference to reach a comprehensive action agreement on achieving SDG 16, along with other SDGs. Together and at all levels, we must do all we can to gain momentum and opportunity the pandemic has brought about. It is up to us to make our contribution as it is in our best interest to leave no one behind. In closing, I thank you and DESA, IDLO and the government of Italy as our partners for contributing to this effort and co-organizing co the conference on SDG 16 today and over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> to welcome uh, Mr. Guido Tesla, uh, Deputy Director General for International Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, Ms. Tesla, the Netherlands has been a champion for SDG 16 and access to justice for all, as well as a leading advocate for greater political and financial support for the rule of law. How has the pandemic affected progress towards these objectives, and why do you believe that it is important to invest in SDG 16 as we seek to recover and rebuild from the crisis. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, please allow me to first um, thank Italy, uh, IDLO and UNDESA for convening this important SDG 16 conference at this critical time. It's really great to have such a diversity of participants and it, I really feel it's helping us enrich our knowledge and finding a way forward. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, because the pandemic, uh, the crisis has precisely exposed and widened inequalities. It has actually exacerbated uh, injustices and it has contributed to a wave of protest and uh, social unrest. So it has led to a crisis, a new crisis of trust between governments and people. And it has in many instances also contributed to eroding the social contract. And I've heard many speakers today speak about the social contract and how important it is. And this conference therefore is very timely as it is more urgent than ever to work to promote just, peaceful and inclusive societies. So in my remarks today, I will focus on the justice pillar uh, of SDG 16. So prior to this pandemic, the Netherlands, we, uh, as the Netherlands, we were part of a justice task force to promote SDG 16.3. And the Justice Task Force report identified a justice gap worldwide of at least 1.5 billion people who could not solve their justice problems. And the report concluded that many justice systems are not fit for purpose to address people's justice needs. So with the pandemic, the justice gap has only grown. For example, think about problems related to employment, debt, bankruptcy, and on top of that, the world has also seen an increase in human rights violations and domestic violence. I believe um, Mr. Joshi Mitsu has also mentioned uh, how the uh, social injustice has increased because of this uh, pandemic. So we know from data produced by the World Justice Report, uh, I mean World Justice Project and OECD, that these justice problems, if not resolved, incur costs in other sectors. They can also have impact on the mental well-being of individuals and communities, and they give grievances, they give rise to grievances and conflicts. In short, these justice problems can further erode the social contract. 
But on the bright side, Jan, as you mentioned yourself, the pandemic also creates opportunities. It allows us to conceive uh, of justice in a new way. And justice ought to be part of the global response that seeks to build stronger societies going forward. It's not about expensive or lengthy solutions. It's about accessible, affordable and fair solutions. And many of these solutions can come at a local level. Take, for example, the organization STER, S-T-E-R in Nigeria. STER stands for Stand to End Rape. It's a youth-led social enterprise which advocates against sexual violence, provides prevention mechanisms, and supports survivors with psychosocial services. To honor what they do, I quote their website stating, we are working towards the day when rape is part of history rather than part of our everyday lives. As, is Mr. As Mrs. Uh, Kotoa mentions, we should listen to youth. They have a lot to offer. It is such initiatives grounded in the local context that we should co uh, collectively be promoting. So to give a new impulse to the justice agenda, the Netherlands organized a ministerial meeting on the 14th of April last, together with the elders, the G7 Plus for Fragile and Conflict Affected States, and the Pathfinders of the Center for International Cooperation at NYU, with the participation of ministers from 14 countries, including justice ministers and development ministers. Really, the meeting was really encouraging. I never heard before people speak so, so many people speak of the concept of people centered justice and speak of the urgency of finding solutions to the justice challenges which are exacerbated by the pandemic. So, I believe this clearly demonstrates the political will for collective action and collaboration going forward. The meeting addressed a letter to the Secretary General of the UN urging him to include people-centered justice in the common agenda. And the letter states that transforming justice by putting people at the center is key to reviving the bonds that hold our societies together and to re-establishing trust between people and communities and governments. For those who want to see the letter, we will place a link uh, to the letter in the chat function of this meeting. This meeting also launched a Justice Action Coalition, a platform of collaboration to continue to translate ideas into action during the pandemic and beyond. The coalition will provide space, a space for those who want to join forces to further the justice theme as part of the SDG 16 agenda. The coalition will be composed of countries, organizations, individuals, and all of those present today, all of you present today, you are invited to participate. There's no formal membership that's not required. It should function as a community of practice coordinated by the pathfinders. And the coalition, what will it do? It will focus on specific themes and promote people-centered justice domestically and internationally. Of course, this is not only for developing countries, this is just as much for countries like mine. And we will mobilize political and financial support, and we will exchange experiences and set out a common research agenda for people-centered justice. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to know exactly what it is and how to promote it. So in this way, it will, it will seek to impact on the ground to make people-centered justice a reality. In conclusion, we look forward to collaborate with all of you on this topic and the Justice Action Coalition. As we start to look ahead to a period beyond the pandemic, restoring trust and the well-being of individuals and communities through justice will be critical to advancing SDG 16. So let us use gatherings like today to align our actions, to exchange ideas, and to learn from pertinent local examples like the one I mentioned there in Nigeria. Those are the voices we need to listen to. And this is where we can learn about solutions that address the needs of people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Zlar, and thank you for sharing of the outcome of your ministerial meeting. I must say that I'm encouraged by what you have said because uh, the focus of the new strategic plan of IDLO is on people-centered justice. So that is that is uh, an optimistic sign. And thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I'm now pleased to welcome Professor Olivier Deschuta, 
uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Professor De Schutte, we are witnessing the worst recession in 90 years. Some 120 million people have fallen back into extreme poverty. You have called the social protection measures adopted by governments in response to the pandemic, and I quote, inattentive to the realities of people in poverty. So could you tell us what has been the impact of COVID-19 on those living in poverty and how can a rights-based approach to social protection contribute to eradicating poverty and reducing inequalities? Well, thank you, Jan, and, and thank you to, of course, the International Development Law Organization, but also the government of Italy and the UN Department on Economic and Social Affairs for making this dialogue possible. I think it's really important to understand that what you called, uh, Jan, the, the, rule of the rule of law based recovery is particularly important for people in poverty. And the reason is, is very simple. We have, as a result of this crisis, probably between 85 and 100 million more people that will fall in extreme poverty, most of them in low income countries. Low income countries are the most affected because they have, lose, they have lost export revenues, because they have lost remittances from migrant workers, because they have high levels of debt, making it very difficult for them to finance an economic recovery as rich countries were able to, but also because low income countries, poor countries have huge gaps in their social protection systems. In fact, globally speaking, it is estimated that about 4 billion people 55% of the world's population has no social protection whatsoever, and only 29% of the world's population is covered uh, throughout uh, their lives from, from cradle to grave, if you wish, as uh, required or recommended by Recommendation 202 on social protection floors adopted unanimously by the International Labour Conference in June 2012. Now, these gaps in social protection explain why most of the impacts, the social impacts of the crisis will take place in developing countries. Of course, we all know that developing countries as others have taken a large number of social protection measures in reaction to the crisis we've seen. However, the amounts invested in social protection pale in comparison with the 13 trillion plus US dollars equivalent injected in recovery plans throughout the world, mostly in OECD countries. And most often, the social protection measures adopted have been ad hoc, short term. They've taken the form of cash transfer systems largely improvised by national administrations rather than rights based standing social protection floors guaranteeing people with entitlements they may claim before independent bodies. Yet a rights-based approach to social protection is absolutely vital to protect social protection from being contaminated by corruption, to protect people from discrimination and arbitrary treatment by social service providers, and to ensure that we um, reduce the huge rates of non-take-up, uh, the phenomenon uh, by which people do not claim the benefits they normally should have a right to because they are poorly informed about their rights, because they fear the shame of claiming benefits because of the stigma attached to calling upon welfare support. So as a result of most social protection measures being not rights-based, but rather ad hoc cash transfer systems put in place and in fact improvised by governments, we have seen that many people have been left out from the social protection responses of governments. Those who are not registered in social registries, for example, let us remember that 46% of children in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, are not registered at birth. The 1.6 billion workers who are informal workers in the global economy, to which we could, we could add 0 0.4 billion um, workers in precarious and non-standard forms of employment, 61% of the global workforce is not well protected by social protection or not protected at all because it is in the informal sector, undocumented migrants, and of course, women who as always shall have to shoulder the burden of the retreat of public services 
and uh, the closure of schools and uh, the overburdening of hospitals. Now, this is why SDG 16 is absolutely vital in my area, the fight against poverty and the strengthening of social protection. SDG 16 is really a tool to ensure that no one shall be left behind, to ensure that all people, men, women, and child, shall be covered by the social protection response from governments. And in no area is this more vital than in this context in the fight against poverty. This rule of law based response to the crisis based on, on SDG 16 is especially important to ensure that the efforts of governments shall not be in vain and that all people shall benefit, particularly the poorest amongst the poor. Many thanks indeed, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Professor de Schutte. And finally, it is a pleasure to invite Professor Harold Coe, a Stirling Professor of International Law uh, at Yale. Professor Coe has previously served as United States Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and as legal advisor to the State Department. So Professor Coe, as one of the world's leading experts in international law, national security law, and human rights, what do you see as the impact of the crisis on human rights and what implications does this have for the 2030 agenda? And how can policymakers most effectively balance public health and human rights concerns going forward? You have the floor, Professor. Thank you, uh, Director General. I, I speak here today, uh, not on behalf of Yale Law School, but on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, thank you for organizing this important conference uh, along with the government of Italy. Uh, and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Since joining IDLO as a founding member more than 30 years ago, the United States has been jointly seeking rule of law solutions to many complex challenges from fighting corruption in the Caribbean to improving confidence in Central American justice systems. And having together endured 13 months of the worst global pandemic of our time, we enthusiastically endorse IDLO's pioneering work with Dr. Dr. Tedros and the WHO and with the UNFAO to promote sound legal and policy frameworks to limit the havoc that future pandemics might cause. During the pandemic, we in the United States have seen new challenges, including domestic terrorism, violence against minority communities, and economic and racial injustice. But these challenges have only strengthened the United States' commitments to the aspirations of SDG 16 namely promoting peaceful and inclusive societies, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions. As a first-generation American, I'm proud to claim these goals, not just as America's values, but as my own life's work. I'm a longtime professor of international law, as you mentioned. I also served as Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor in the Clinton administration, legal advisor of the State Department in the Obama administration, and now for the first 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration as the senior political appointee in the legal advisor's office. During our 250 year struggle for a more perfect union, the US has been and will remain a champion of both the rule of law and access to justice. So we unqualifiedly endorse the call of the IDLO for greater policy focus on these issues as fundamental components of any sustainable global recovery to COVID-19. Uh, let me briefly address three issues, impact, weaknesses, and future implications. First, how has COVID-19 impacted progress on the three pillars of SDG 16, peace, justice, and accountable institutions? We all know the negative impact has been profound and disproportionately felt by groups at the margins of society, the poor, minorities, women, children, the sick, the elderly, immigrants, members of the LGBTQ community and persons with disabilities. As President Biden has observed, our world is at an inflection point. Together we face four interconnected crises of democracy, human rights, climate, and health. Democracies around the world, including the United States, are under siege from these quadruple crises which generate corruption, inequality, polarization, populism, and illiberal threats to the rule of law. These crises and the SDGs that address them are deeply interconnected. As democracy has suffered, so too has human rights. Climate change and the pandemic have disrupted order and weakened democracy and the enjoyment of human rights. 
As we argued during the negotiations leading to the adoption of the 200, 2030 agenda, and I reiterate today, sound judicial institutions are fundamental to every global development goal from achieving zero hunger to quality education to climate change. Yet development assistance for justice currently covers only 1% of the costs in low-income countries. Donor support for justice systems has recently fallen globally by 40%. For that reason, the United States welcomes IDLO's focus on the impact of climate change on human rights, environmental justice, and the marginalized and vulnerable. Just last week, as you saw, President Biden convened a global leader summit on climate that was attended by more than 40 world leaders. And our pres presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, has echoed ideological concerns by highlighting how climate change widens gaps in the rule of law and justice, is linked to a higher incidence of cancer, cancer in communities of color, and drastically impacts migration and forced displacement. Second, what weaknesses has the COVID-19 pandemic exposed? Dramatic weaknesses in governance the pandemic on pre-existing legal gaps. Consider this sobering fact. One century ago, the Spanish flu pandemic affected 500 million people worldwide and killed 675,000 people in the United States alone. Today, the COVID-19 pandemic has afflicted nearly 150 million worldwide and killed nearly 600,000, close to the same number in the United States. So even with all the intervening advances in technology, science, medicine, civil society, domestic and global governance, we will soon lose more people to COVID-19 than we're lost to the Spanish flu. Clearly we need to do more, which is why global leaders, including President Biden and Secretary General Guterres have called on us to build back better following the pandemic's devastation. We especially need to harness the dramatic improvements in technology to promote better access to justice in the digital space. To take just one example, your organization, Director General IDLO, was recently honored as a USAID Digital Development Award winner for e-justice and judicial transparency work in the Kyrgyz Republic. With your help, <clears throat> as of December 2019, nearly 90% of all judicial decisions in that country are now promptly published online and without personally identifiable information. Third and finally, what are the future implications of these quadruple crises for the 2030 agenda? The question you asked. None of these objectives, ending poverty, combating inequality, promoting inclusion, or securing good governance can be achieved without concerted attention to the rule of law and access to justice for all. Democracy can't be sustained without the rule of law. Human rights can't be protected unless minority groups have access to the courts. Legislative and administrative agencies, good climate governance cannot result unless nations and private stakeholders are accountable to one another through a transparent framework of domestic and international law. And as the last year has taught us, the right balance can't be struck between individual freedoms and public health unless courts, legislatures, executive officials, and the media tell the truth listen to affected populations, protect minorities, open political channels, and clarify when pressing public human rights and public health concerns must override understandable desires to operate free from governmental constraint. In closing, the rule of law and access to justice are central, not just when responding to COVID-19, but in pursuing all forms of sustainable development that will determine our global future. We must all acknowledge prioritize and yes, fund activities related to the rule of law, access to justice and good governance. Without doing so, we cannot solve any of our four crises. And unless we do so, we will not advance to a better world in 2030 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ko, and thank you very much for your support for SDG 16 and for the entire uh, 2030 uh, agenda. I think it's been a very interesting opening session for this conference and uh, what uh, I feel has come out of it is uh, from whichever perspective um, our speakers were addressing uh, the problems, uh, there's a great deal of consensus uh, around the fact of the 
incredible exacerbation of inequalities uh, of all kinds that have uh, been the result uh, of the pandemic and that have set back uh, action on the SDGs, which um, as many have said, were already lagging, but has set it back, back further in so many ways. And, um, and it, not just um, economic uh, and financial ways, but also uh, social, um, environmental uh, and human rights uh, ways. So I think what it has been um, encouraging, however, is a recognition that has come through all of the speakers that it is the most vulnerable um, who uh, are not only um, those who are the most affected, but those who absolutely need uh, the rule of law based response. And that the key importance of um, rule of law based responses, people centered justice to help to um, rebuild that deficit of trust that so many of you spoke about to help um, strengthen the frayed um, social, contra uh, social contract or the, um, I think uh, Dr. Tedros called it the, the tears in multilateralism uh, to bring us all together. Um, perhaps uh, the pandemic is going to be able uh, to do that because it has been such a great shock um, to the world as a whole. I think that we will be discussing this further in our next session. Um, we'll take a short break now. Our next session um, will be really on enhancing resilience to shocks and crises and what are the lessons, really the lessons learned and how we can use those lessons learned, many of which you have already uh, drawn out and we will draw out more in the next session and think about um, the way in which they may help us to build more just and inclusive societies uh, going forward. So I look forward to see you all in just uh, maybe uh, five minutes or so at around uh, 3.45 row time. And thank to all of the speakers. Thank you so much, particularly thanks to, to you, Minister in Japan, for staying up so late uh, with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, goodbye for now. See you in a few minutes. <laughs>